Hello and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. We are here for the final word. I'm joined by Joe from the Twitter account Irish underscore abroad and there's also a website. Do you want to give the website a it's, quick shout out? Uh, Irish-, <clears throat> Irish dash abroad dot spot dot com. And by now you all know Gary Spain, legendary Irish fan. In show. It's, becoming a, it's becoming a regular thing okay. now, Gary. You're going to be part of the furniture soon enough. But uh, we, are, we are here to discuss Ireland's 3-1 victory over Bulgaria. Um, at the Aviva last night. Now, just let's talk through the lineup. I suppose uh, a fair few fresh changes that were badly needed. I think everybody was calling for some fresh faces. Not that anyone did anything wrong from the game against Switzerland. It was just people just wanted to see some some new players get a chance. The likes of Mark Travers, the likes of Josh Cullen, even Ron and Curtis getting a start and that. Um, Alan but, Brown, who's been Alan Brown, up yeah. quite a lot. Yeah. And got it. But we're yeah. kind of overall, yeah. so we go through the line, but it was Mark Travers and goal. Then you had Cyrus Christie, who you had in the Stanton 11 show. Um, Kevin Long, John Egan, captain, which came out earlier in the day. Connor Harrowham was left back, which we found out as well. That was actually embargoed in the press conference, and he couldn't say anything until, I think, yesterday or 11 o'clock on, on Wednesday night. Uh, then we had Alan Brown, Josh Cullen, and... Um, Judge in the middle. Uh, Alan Judge yeah. just ahead of him, yeah. sorry. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and then we had uh, O'Dowda and um, Scott Hogan and Ronan Curtis then. So, uh, I mean, it was a mixture of kind of uh, experience uh, and youth. So I thought I was happy enough with it. Like, what what, what did you think? Because it wasn't far off, I don't think, what we picked in the starting level. Yeah, I, I think we all expected that the, the squad members were going to get a run out and, and those that had started and played and made a significant contribution against Switzerland were going to be given the night off and people needed game time as well so but yeah I, yeah it was more or less along the lines i know we got different names and we got some right and some wrong but i think it was along the lines of what we yeah expected. you weren't you, were, you weren't like disappointed yeah. or or being on a, oh, why is he in there you know maybe i don't a couple of people were complaining about jack Byrne not being in there what, what were you thinking joe uh yeah the same as as you said i was thinking look there's one or two players and one or two positions that we've been crying out for cover for the last couple of games and you know we've had a look at them in an international game okay it wasn't the highest priority or the highest profile game but at least we can say now they have an international cap we know they can do a job for us and so the occasion arise if someone is injured or out of form is suspended we've no qualms about bringing them into the first team yeah absolutely yeah i completely agree and uh although it was played very much the first half at least and there's not a lot to talk about in the first half which we we i had said actually in the aftermatch reaction uh, and we had said off air there's not a whole lot to talk about in the first half not a lot, lot of chances it was very much like watching a training match it was it was very low key a, a couple of people in front of me actually left at half time they just walked out and said they've had enough yeah i was surprised actually that there wasn't uh the, the crowd there wasn't a lot of people there at all really was there yeah i think of eighteen thousand or so was the yeah. attendance which yeah it is disappointing but having said that it's a tuesday night it's a friendly so i really wasn't expecting too many more than that yeah um, no I, I get where you're coming from as well i was just a bit surprised because i heard people were giving out tickets and stuff like that but i i, I understand and teams are back trained and stuff like that now as well so there is that to take into consideration Um, second half i suppose we'll just jump straight you know, skip the first half altogether. There was a, a couple of wayward <laughs> shots, not a whole lot going on. We did dominate, though. I will say that we dominated possession, which we don't normally do. I suppose I was happy in, in that aspect. But then into the second half, then obviously we get our goal with uh, Ronan Curtis cutting in on his right foot. Takes it. It, it, it was a good shot, to be fair. Keeper made a yeah. good save. I don't know. Now, I haven't. I, I watched it back, and I don't know whether Scott Hogan was shooting or passing there. I, I, I thought he was passing. And now I'll yes. give him the credit. I thought he he did it well. Now, it was just the the manoeuvre looked very uh, yeah. unorthodox. Like. Okay, yeah, maybe I'd have to watch it a few times. Um, I I I I watched it live and I've I've watched the goals back and I thought he was passing. I'll give yeah, it, no, the, the I watched when I doubt. watched it live. I thought that too, but yeah. then I watched it back and I the, on the replay because there's a screen in front of us and uh, it kind of looked like he kind of manoeuvred to shot or to shoot. Sorry. But anyway, Alan Brown comes in and scores, and I think a lot of people were happy just to see him. He, he, from what I've seen and heard, he hasn't got a lot of game time for Preston this season. So, and he was banging them in last season. Mick keeps going on about the twelve goals that he got, and uh, he wants to see him doing it for for Ireland. Uh, I was delighted for him personally. Yeah, uh, me too, because he's turned up for, he's been around the squad without getting a lot of minutes on the pitch, and it was great for him to start. I I thought he had a fine game. He was very busy. He was involved in everything. 
and uh, okay, I mean he's lethal from six inches in front of goal anyway. <laughs> but uh, he's he scores quite a few from further out as well. And he was in the position; it was a tap in, but he he was in the position to put it in the net as well. Yeah, Joe, we, we, it was, did anyone kind of catch a eye at that stage? Even even Alan Brown. Uh, well, I thought Josh Cullen looked really good in centre midfield. Um, you know, he was good in possession, good range of passing. Um, you know, he was tracking back. Uh, I think more than. More than I think other players, other the other midfielders had been doing. Uh, at that stage, like after the first half, you know the 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 Bulgarians' pattern of play was pretty obvious. It was like when Ireland are in possession, we've got uh five in defence, four in midfield, and one player standing on the on the halfway line. I mean, I I genuinely don't think they had a single player in our half of the pitch while we had possession. Um, and then if we surrender possession or you know they got possession back, then it was breaking at pace and you know we did I think fall into the trap of pushing forward a little too much leaving spaces but uh, I was very impressed with Colin and his his efforts to get back to make sure that the, the spaces were marked um, and again like if we do need a player to come into centre midfield I think he's probably uh, first in line at the moment. I think now now more so than ever yeah he's been in the last kind of couple of squads as well he's the only player really to fill in that mantle I suppose um, that specific defensive yeah. midfield position, he's playing it regularly. So it's yeah. not a case where Mick has to go, well, I like, kind of need you. I know the way you're playing attacking midfielder for Charles, or well, say say Jeff Hendrick or something, he tries to put, it's completely different. The, the roles are totally different. Like It's not like you yeah. can you can just say to someone, you know, oh, I want to change you from an attacking midfielder to defensive midfielder. Cullen is just nails on, that's his position. Yeah. And I think... Uh, Unless James McCarthy gets a whole lot of games in between now and then, which I don't think he will. Uh, I do think Cullen is next in line after Whelan. I still don't think he'll get in there ahead of Whelan for the next three games. I just think they're that big a game. I, I think Mick is very loyal to players that have done well for him. And he's come out and said it like as well. Uh, you know, the, the the Georgia game. He wasn't bad against Switzerland either, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, Glenn, uh, Glenn Whelan starts in that position for me. Even if, uh, I think at the moment, even if James McCarthy is available, the other option there is Harry Arthur. But yeah. I'm not, I'm still not convinced about Harry Arthur as a defensive midfield player and and doing the the Glenn Whelan role. Are you are you are you more concerned about his, uh, I suppose, his heart towards Ireland? Is he, I, if is he committed? Like, I, well, there's big question marks over that, but it's not so much even that. I, I I don't think we've seen the Harry Arthur in a green shirt that we've seen in club football. Yeah, you know, if clubs, and I mean, if... well, my only my only kind of counteract to that would be the football we had played under Martin O'Neill was very long ball. Okay, how how much has he played under Mick? I mean, I don't I don't yeah, recall no, too I, much I of him playing. Okay, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, but you know, we were saying the other night how much you know uh, Mick's football suits Glenn Whelan. Okay. You know what I mean? It might suit Harry Arthur. I don't think he's he's really had a look in. Yeah. At this stage yet, but uh, you know, uh, uh, so far what you're saying is right. But if he used to be brought in, but I do yeah. think again, you know, Glenn Whelan was meant to be the scapegoat for that position. Uh, Harry Arthur was as well when he came in, just because you know, literally under O'Neill, our defense would get it and just as kick it as high yeah. up the pitch as we could, and that was it. And then we were just constantly on the back foot defending, and the you know the, the defensive midfielders would just get criticism. But what are they supposed to do? Literally, they're just constantly defending because it was going to Shane Long say. And you know he's not going to take the ball in all day long. So he'll get in all, over the top, but he's not going to be yeah, taking it, balls in. You know he tries to get flick on. It, and stuff it like didn't that. stick when it went up. Yeah. I think which is it's a bit different with David McGoldrick. Now yeah, as well. but I think it did with what with, with John Walters when he was fit. I did, do think it, it yeah. stuck up there more so on the right hand side. But um, anyway, back kind of back to what we we're we we're saying here. Josh Cullen was fantastic. Um, I actually caught up with him after the match, so you can. Here we go. Here we are, uh, Josh Cullen, man of the match performance tonight. Um, what were your feelings coming, uh, I suppose, during the week? Uh, did you know you were going to be starting today before the game? Yeah, we found out on uh, Sunday in training um, what the team was, so I was just looking forward to it. Obviously, um, I guess a, a dream come true, that's what you grow up dreaming, to play for your country and um, to be able to, to fulfil that tonight. Um, yeah, I was buzzing for the last couple of days and, and was just looking forward to it and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Talk us through your kind of feelings throughout the day, you know, where did you get butterflies in your, in your stomach, I suppose? Yeah, of course, I, I, you get butterflies before every game, um, but more so today. Um, obviously being your, your international debut uh, for your country so yeah I'd be lying if I was saying there wasn't some nerves there there always is um, and like I said more so today but um, yeah I think that's a good thing it means you're on the edge and, and, 
and I was also excited to play and just get out there and and, um, and try and play as well as I could. One more point about that position is that we have two very tough away games in four days next month. Yeah. I don't know if Glenn Whelan's legs will last 180 highly intensive minutes in two crucial qualifiers. So it is good to have the option. And I, I, I'm debating with myself which of the two is the most important. And I, I, I'm i inclined to say Georgia at yeah. this stage is the crucial game. We, Well, Denmark have gone to Georgia and dropped points. We can't afford to do that. Yeah, we need a result. Like, whatever we get against Switzerland is going to be a bonus because um, no one expects us to get anything there. And we don't really have a great record in... Yeah, away to Switzerland in either in Geneva or, or St. Jaco Park or wherever. So I think, uh, yeah, the Georgia game is probably is more important. And, you know, that's the same night then the Switzerland go to Denmark, which again has a massive in, uh, impact on the final uh, the final positions. If yeah. Switzerland win that game, then we're, are, we're really looking good to qualify automatically. Yeah. If we, if we if actually we, if win, if we can win in Tbilisi and Denmark don't beat Switzerland, mm. A draw at home to Denmark sends us through, regardless of what happens in Geneva. Yeah, but just kind of go to your point there about uh, the two lads. Would it be a case, would you start Josh Cullen against Georgia and have Glenn Whelan against Switzerland, or would you rotate uh, that or have Peter play I, both? No, I'd start Glenn Whelan against Georgia in Tbilisi. I think Glenn Whelan is still the man in with the short. Yeah, no, I'm not saying that, yeah. but because George is a less, well, I wouldn't say a lesser game, but it's a lesser talent um, for, for Cullen maybe to deal with more so than Whelan. Oh, because I Whelan would, would play then against Switzerland. No, I, I wouldn't risk that. I, they, I, they've they got some... They, yeah, no, I'm not saying they're one of the bad, but we, Cullen yeah. would have more legs yeah. to get about, you know? I think experience is going to be a factor there as mm. well. Like, like Cullen played really well last night, but it was his debut and it was at home. Tbilisi is a tough place to go and get a result. We ha- I don't think we've ever scored more than twice there, and we've always and we've always conceded once. So, you know, the the last game where we played there was one all, and Duffy, yeah. yeah, and it was a yeah. horrible game of football. Um, but Glen Whelan has the experience of going to these places, and Colin doesn't right now. I mean, by all means, have him on the bench as an option to come on, but. I genuinely, I don't think he'll start. Yeah, no, I'm just saying as a, as a, a, a kind of what to, what Gary was saying, just in regards to the games in just a short space of time. Mm. That's the only reason I was saying that. I mean, if you can manage the two games, well, I, I I would start playing Whelan and Tbilisi, but uh, and and take the risk and hopefully if one if we get the three points, I I'd still oh, start well, him in Geneva, but yeah, he, possibly that. And I mean, he he may have to come off in in Tbilisi. It shouldn't be too hot there, I think, in October. It was quite hot there last time, but that was in September. Okay, yeah. Um, but it, it is an early enough kickoff as well. It's mm. uh, I think it's is it 2 o'clock here. It's about 5 o'clock over there. So yeah. I will, um, We'll worry about picking the team kind of when, when that okay. kind of comes around next month. But uh, just onto the subs then, obviously Jack Byrne and, and James Collins came on. And when they came on, we went down and, and Cyrus Christie starts messing about with the ball at the edge of his box. <laughs> And then uh, it prompts Egan to make that fail. Then I don't think there was a whole lot Egan could do. He was done, and he didn't really want to concede that goal. I yeah. don't think I don't think he makes that fail in a uh, a qualifier. I don't think he makes that fail. Yeah, I suppose it was. Yeah, I mean, Sai probably he should have cleared the ball. I mean, oh, he should have. Yeah. yeah, that's and yeah, it's still you don't want to give away a penalty. I mean. But, I think he was doing yeah. everything to because he made a fair few good blocks in front. Okay. Of, to be fair to him, I seen someone saying like John Egan is a imposter and all this stuff. I I, I don't know what game they were watching. Oh no, that's, I, I thought, thought that he, was the only thing bad he did yeah, was I, was I thought penalty. he had a good game. I I, I thought both centre backs yeah, yeah, did very well as well. Good, yeah. yeah, um, they were they had a they had fine games. Not tested hugely, but yeah, um, yeah. Apart from the penalty, yeah. I um, thought we were a bit. I thought we were a bit. Um, we didn't look. Like we had a lot of balance with Howard playing left back. I thought we didn't have a lot of balance, and I thought then the way the kind of subs kind of came in, then obviously McLean and then Stevens came on and Curtis came off, and he was just kind of mixing a match. And we finally got a bit of shape then. We really started to take yeah. the game. But before uh, I think McLean came on and Stevens came on, Jack Byrne was on, and he was starting to kind of maybe at the first couple of minutes he didn't really do too much, and then he started getting the ball or getting the hold of the ball, demanding passes like he would at Shamrock Rovers yeah. every week. He, he's the loudest player on the pitch, you know, screaming and going mad at everyone. But you can see him wanting the ball, wanting to get on it, and he was picking really good passes here, there, and everywhere. 
But he whips in a great corner and Kevin Long scores. And then it was kind of because it was that point we were kind of going the usual, you know, where we're going to get a goal from. And then obviously we get the goal and, uh, you know, the place got a bit lively again. Yeah, it, yeah, it did. I mean, it, it, there was a small crowd there, but yeah, I think the atmosphere in the second half was was quite good, and yeah, Jack Byrne certainly livened it up. Um, it, it, it's no surprise to anybody watching him week in week out with Shamrock Rovers. It's probably no surprise if you go back a few years that he was one of the great hopes yeah. of the Irish team, even when he was playing over in Holland or when he was coming through at City originally. Um, Definitely lost his way a bit. Um, I think he came, ended up was it Kilmarnock or somewhere. That was last season. Last season, yeah. you know. I mean, and we're thinking, God, is this another one of our great hopes? That's uh, well, he's spoke, he's come out and spoke. Like I did an interview with him as well up in in Tala and all, and uh, he seems like he, he he kind of fell on hard times. Like managers got sacked, that brought him in, and he was he left yeah. he left uh, City to sign for um, Wigan. And then within six months, the manager from there got sacked. Then he ended up going Blackburn, Oldham, and then Kilmarnock, oh, and yeah. then back. So it can be that kind of case where you take that gamble and it just ultimately doesn't pay off. And you can see when he talks about it, like, he's a very smart young man, like, um, in regards to his career. Like, he, you can tell maybe, okay, it didn't really work out for him, but he came back here to, to get back just playing football again and it seems yeah. to ultimately to be paying and he's off. This, I think he's the standout player in the league. Oh, yeah, here yeah, at yeah. home this season there's a few off Dundalk as well and Dundalk fans will be going mad now if you yeah, yeah no, 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 look Dundalk are the best team right they're going to yeah. win they are going to win the league and I'm <laughs> I'm a Limerick fan so I can be neutral on this right but, uh, yeah. <laughs> so but I think Jack Bourne is the standout player last night was when when he came on we saw the same Jack Bourne you're watching in Tala or around the league every week on the international stage he not only did he not look out of place, he he was there. He was demanding the ball. He he looked like he was born to be there, and I mean he was involved in in both goals. Yeah. What what, what were your thoughts on him, John? Yeah, looked really good when he came on. Um, I think you know uh, a few of us in the crowd had kind of accepted this is going to finish one one. Um, but when he came on, he was demanding the ball and he was driving forward, which. Not to say like uh, uh, Colin or uh, Judge hadn't been doing that. He was just doing it a bit more. And just, uh, what we had felt was that the, the Irish players were slow to come forward in possession, which was allowing Bulgaria to get back into position. But when he had the ball, he was driving at them and he wasn't giving them time to get into position. He wasn't giving them time to settle. And I think the, the final goal of the night was a really a really good example of what, what, he was, what he was doing that nobody else had been doing. You know, he was... Receiving the ball, looking around, who's free? Okay, I'm gonna make space. I'm gonna make the pass. Um, there was three, four touches, you know, from centre midfield out to the right, uh, or sorry, out to the left, and then yeah, back into the centre, yeah, into uh the six yard area and converted by Collins. You know, doing what what a striker should do. You know, gambling that ball is gonna come yeah. across and he's gonna get on the end of it. Um, and it's the kind of goal that we haven't really seen a lot of in the in the recent past. You know, a lot of our goals are coming from from set pieces, and I know that, like the second goal was uh, was from a corner, but it, it was just it was one touch football, and it was really nice to see. And I think it, you know it gave the crowd uh, a really good feeling, um, and uh, a lot to look forward to. Yeah, I thought I thought the ball he gave to Stevens, and then Stevens's ball back across was equally as good for for Collins, and as you say. Showed uh, the ultimate strikers, you know, um, poacher's goal really wasn't it? Yeah. It was, it was it, that one to actually get in there, get your toe onto it, which I don't see enough of our strikers doing. I don't think Hogan would have scored that goal if I'm being honest. Uh, not to say that uh, Collins is better, but I do think that we just need to touch on Collins' performance. I thought what was good about him was he was he, he something we lacked. I think last year more than any anywhere as it wasn't sticking as as you said earlier. I know David McGall has come in recently and that has happened. But I think he's stronger than, than David McGoldrick. And I, maybe, you know, maybe I'm reading too much into it because it's a friendly. But I do think he was buying us fouls and, you know, he was winning a lot of balls up there and just putting the defenders on, or just kind of putting them under a lot of pressure not to use, uh, you know. Yeah, no, the, I, I thought he did well. Phase. And I think he's probably moved ahead of Scott Hogan now based on, on the cameo last night. Yeah. 
because he, he, he did make more of an impact and it was a real striker's goal. I think it's maybe one Scott Hogan might have got in his Brentford days. but Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I think I think with, with uh, Collins, he didn't at the occasion get to him. I think maybe someone like uh, maybe Ronan Curtis, it was his first start, maybe he felt like he was a bit under pressure, you know. Didn't yeah. think he was as bad as, you know, he, the level of criticism I was seeing online. But um, he wasn't. Uh, he didn't light the place up, which I think a lot of people thought he was going to. But we're forgetting that you know last season he was in that really rich vein of form. This season he's he started okay, but nowhere near the form he was at last year. You know what I mean? That yeah. could be a factor. I don't know, but uh, yeah, I do. I do think that Collins took his chance, took his moment. You know. Yeah, I, I think he did, I, I, and Jack Bourne did as well. Can I just go back to that pass as well because it was just sublime, and it was just perfect for Enda Stevens. I think he met it full on the volley to volley it across, and, and James Collins, fantastic poacher's goal. But it was, it's one of the best goals I've seen a score for a long time. Yeah, and uh, as Joe said, not the typical Irish goal by any means. You know? Yeah, it was great. It was great. Yeah. You, like I, I yeah. think people were actually in disbelief when it actually went in. Go, well, well, we can play a bit. You know, I actually caught up with uh, James Collins after the game, and here you can hear what he says about his goal. It's going to James, um, your Aviva debut and a goal. Talk me through the game. What was it like when you came on? Um, yeah, it was uh, some feeling um, when the gaffer told me to get ready. Um, I was uh, I was buzzing and to, to get on the pitch tonight was amazing. And uh, obviously to cap off with a goal, uh, I couldn't have uh, dreamed it any better. Yeah, you spoke uh, about David McGoldrick scoring the other night in the place uh, going wild, and you want to replicate that. The, what's it, how did you feel when it actually happened? Yeah, well, it all happened so quickly. It's uh, but. Once it went in, I just uh, I was so happy, and um, it was a surreal moment for me. And uh, to score at the Aviva in front of all them great fans is uh, is a real special night. There you go. Obviously, James Collins absolutely delighted with his goal and scoring at the Aviva. Uh, overall thoughts on him, Joe? Yeah, I was really impressed with him. You know, I mean, it's it's the ideal debut. You come on in front of your home crowd, and and you get the the the, the final goal of the game, and uh, you know, and probably the best goal of the game, if if I'm honest. Um, uh, I've been watching Collins for a little while. Um, you know, he started out at Villa and didn't work out there for you know whatever reason. You know, he's not the the first player to, not to to make the grade at an academy. But you know, he he did. Well, he went and played in lower league clubs, and you know, he's got a lot of experience uh, for a, a player his age, and he's worked his way up through the leagues. He got his his chance with Luton. Uh, you know, he was their top scorer last season, and he's you know he's not been. A, not been overawed or not uh, in in the championship. He's scoring there as well, um, and now he's an international player, and an international striker. So, you know, I, I read a stat that he scores in every division in every cup in England, and now at international level, apart from the Premier League. So, you know, there's still time for him to to get that final uh, that final score that goal in the Premier League. Absolutely, absolutely. You want to touch on him as well, Gary? Yeah, but I just want to touch on the way we we finished the game. Because I think it was the last minute or two minutes of added time, we just kept the ball. And I don't know, I didn't get to count the number of passes, must watch it back. But it, it, it ended with the referee blowing the final whistle. And that was nice to see as well. I mean, we were 3-1 up and we were just passing the ball around and Bulgaria were chasing, couldn't get it off us. Were you expecting some Olays in the crowd? Weren't you? <laughs> I was, but there weren't that many left. Yeah, so. I thought that as well. <laughs> but overall, uh, 3-1, I think uh, I think everyone was happy. You know, it was a feel-good factor again. And I, I do yeah. touch back on last this time last year when, you know, there was no hope for Irish football. Like, everyone was so down with everything. We, we didn't look like we had any strikers. We didn't look like we had any good players coming through. The players that were coming through weren't used properly. And it was just, yeah, it was just abysmal last year. And I think, and I said, I spoke to Darren Randolph about this the other day, and I, and I said to him, like, oh, it's, it's brilliant. This was before the uh, Bulgaria game. And uh, he was just going over to train. I said, do, 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 "Do you feel it as well?" I said, "This this is a real feel good factor back now." And he just he just kind of pointed out because it's because of him, Mick. Yeah. So it's the difference between O'Neill and Mick. Now he didn't say anything bad about O'Neill. You know, uh, it was just literally he just goes, "It's it's because of him." So I think he has his naysayers, McCarthy, and I think it goes to show if you look, if you if if you had said to us that we were top of the group and unbeaten. This time last year, I wouldn't have believed you. I wouldn't have believed you. No, this time last year we were we had lost four one to Wales and Cardiff. Yeah, and that's that's where that, we were. Yeah, that was, yeah. Quick, that was great. Yeah, yeah, there there was a lot to look forward to last year. Uh, we got played off the park by by a Welsh side with a rookie manager and you know an eighteen year old in centre midfield. 
um, a really good 18 year old and yeah. obviously and a rookie manager with you know uh, the biggest collection of trophies in British football history but we shouldn't have been beaten for one and we just we no one really knew where Irish football was going to go in the next 12 months um, I think the appointment was the right appointment Mick McCarthy you know a lot of people are talking about just the feel good factor and it's 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 enjoying it's an it's enjoying experience to go to our, to an Irish football match now, and it wasn't for a very long time. It was abysmal. Uh, the last the last uh, probably after the Denmark game, it was abysmal yeah. that whole year. The Denmark game should have been the end of that managerial yeah. team. I mean, we have an unfortunate history of managers staying on maybe for a campaign too long. Um, well, and Mick actually said that before yeah. about about himself. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that that's really only true with hindsight. I mean, if we go back to to two thousand and two, the first game after the World Cup was a friendly against Finland, and we won three 0 and Graham Barrett scored in his debut, and everyone was thinking, okay, we've bound, we've moved on. There's young players coming through, um, and then we went and lost in Russia, and then the Switzerland game came and. I wasn't at the game, but I remember watching it on telly, and it was just a, a nasty, nasty atmosphere. And uh, I think uh, Mick said in a, an interview with, uh, with Reggie Sadler that he kind of made a decision before full time that he was going to step aside at that stage. Um, but well, there is other managers, Trapatoni yeah. and, and O'Neill. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, is there anyone else really off the top of your head? Well, even Jack. Jack yeah, probably uh, stayed a, a campaign too long. Had yeah. Jack left after USA 94, you know? That's why I kind of like yeah. the fact that Stephen Kenny and the the success succession plan there. I I actually agree with it, and you know it's paid dividends that he's getting to work with those players now. As you can see, and we're going to do a separate video on the twenty ones as well, so make sure you check that out. But lastly, he wanted to touch on the playoffs and how they were, uh, how basically, if it comes to it, yeah, how it works out. Okay, so so, so hopefully, in light, in light. hopefully we don't need a playoff. Okay? Yeah, okay, that's hopefully number. we'll finish in the top two and we don't care about any of this. If we don't qualify directly, regardless of what position, although we did, the lowest we're going to finish is third, obviously. But if we don't qualify directly, the playoffs are reasonably complicated, but they're based on the Nations League rankings. And we were ranked at the end of the Nations League in 23rd position or 11th in League B or 23rd overall. So there's 12 League A countries and 11 we're 11th of the League B countries. So what we need... So there's going to be a, a League A playoff with four teams and a League B playoff with four teams. Certain countries are already guaranteed. The likes of Bosnia, and they are going to be in a playoff. Scotland in League C are guaranteed a playoff because they haven't a hope in hell of qualifying now. Um, so for us to get a playoff, we need, in simple terms, 15 of the 22 countries ahead of us to qualify directly. Now, that's not as hard as it sounds because if we don't do it, two of them are Denmark and Switzerland, obviously. Yeah. Uh, you can actually look through the groups and I'm pretty certain I can already name 15 that will qualify. So I would be confident enough to say now, if we need it, we are pretty much guaranteed a playoff. Um, the only ones that might be a small bit dubious are... Uh, we need Ukraine and Portugal to finish out. So they, they should both qualify comfortably enough. They have a few of the minnows to take care of. Um, they're, so what are the ones? The likes of Italy are definitely going to be there. Spain are going to be there. England are going to go through. Germany. Germany I'm, I'm counting Germany and the Netherlands. I, I don't think Northern Ireland have any real chance. Yeah. Um, Again, so if Northern Ireland were to come through, that would be one of the ones gone and for us. France? Yeah, well, two of France, Turkey and Iceland, likely to be France and Turkey. Albania have an outside shot, which would screw us, but they've got to go and win in Turkey and win in France. Mm. It's not happening. So <laughs> I, I, they win last night against the Czechs, I think. They beat Iceland last Iceland, night, sorry, yeah. So, yeah, so I think there's 15 there. And now, even if you take those 15 after that, the... The other ones that we, we would need, well, if those 15s we get a playoff, the other ones we'd be cheering on would be we'd want the Czech Republic to qualify ahead of Kosovo. We'd want Austria to qualify along with Poland. They were in a battle with Slovenia. We'd want Sweden to qualify, not Norway or Romania. So it, it's the, And we, we'd also want either Slovakia or Wales 
to qualify with Croatia or two of those three. Uh, but Hungary are very much in the mix at the moment. So even if one of our 15 went wrong, just one of those to come back would also get us a playoff. So I think we're pretty much guaranteed a playoff. Next thing is the playoffs are run with two semi-finals and a final. The final is a, a draw. It's it, It'll be one of the winners will be at home. The semi-finals are done on the rankings. So to get a home semi-final, it gets a bit trickier because it looks like if only 15 qualify, we will be away. To get a home semi-final, we probably need... There is another scenario with exactly so many numbers, but it's highly unlikely. To get a home semi-final, we need 19 of those 20 countries that qualify directly to be ahead of us. That's a big ask. So Bosnia, in my view, are already gone. So Bosnia are nailed on. League B, playoff, they'll have a home semi-final because they're the highest ranked League B team. So assuming Bosnia don't come back, which I can't see happening, we need every other group to go right. So then we need Sweden, we need Austria. Uh, we need Slovakia or Wales and uh, and Croatia. Mm. This um, is all worst case scenario. This is all worst case scenario, but I think a home semi final is probably highly unlikely. So, the teams I see being in the playoff, I think Iceland are probably going to be the only League A team in the end. Croatia, Portugal, possibly even the Dutch, but it's not going to happen. Could end up in the playoff, but uh, I think it's Iceland. You're probably going to have a couple of League B teams moving up. So who could we get? The likes of Bosnia, maybe Austria, Slovakia away, Iceland away. Um, but I, w- I wouldn't be too worried about some of them. Uh, Austria are always a little bit dodgy. But anyway, I suppose we can't really. It's only hypothetically speaking. So. Yeah, yeah. It's it, but I think we can be pretty much sure. Sure. Hopefully, we won't need it. But if we need it we will get a playoff. Well, thank you for educating us on that because I didn't know all that and I hope you guys at home appreciate that. I suppose that's been it for, for the final word. That's a uh, huge thanks to Joe from Irish Abroad. Make sure to check him out. He um, does great work and if you ever need to know any info about any players that are playing, or Irish players that are playing abroad, check it out uh, on Twitter, Irish underscore abroad and the link for your website is? It's irish-abroad.appspot.com uh, and uh, huge thanks to Gary as always uh, drop a like on the video if you like this video and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already we'll speak to you soon thank you for watching